Hi everyone, Wally Nichols for the Asset Guidance Group weekly update for the week ending April 30th, 2021. The IRS recently issued some guidance on new required minimum distribution rules for inherited IRAs and it caused quite a bit of uh, a stir and consternation among professional tax preparers, CPAs, estate planners, and uh, financial planners. Uh, this week we'll talk about the R&D rules and potential solutions. Next week we'll talk a little bit more about the guidance that's probably going to have to be updated again. Right now let's get into it. Okay, so let's discuss the new RMD, the Required Minimum Distribution Rules on Inherited IRAs, because the IRS, like I said, uh, has uh, created quite a bit of stir with their new guidance. They're probably going to update with some additional guidance. The guidance that they uh, have right now, we'll talk a little bit about, more about this next week, but it's internally inconsistent. So right now, let's talk about the Inherited IRA situation, some potential, some potential trust workarounds to get through it. First, I got to give you the disclosure statements, make sure that uh, we're in compliance with everybody. Go to assetguidancegroup.com. You can find out all about us. You can download our forms, ADV disclosures, and uh, you can also uh, uh, see all of our other uh, offerings uh, that are available to you. Remember past performance, no guarantee of future results. And particularly uh, this week, I want to note that uh, our qualified plan confidence, our plan confidence service, which provides monthly uh, information and professional advice to subscribers that's custom tailored to their own company's uh, employer sponsored 401k plans, et cetera, 403B, 450s. It depends upon what industry you're in, type of employer that you have. But anyway, you can go to assetguidancegroup.com, look for that black got 401k image. You can hit that. Or as you scroll down through the page, if there's some other information you want to see, there's also a button there for uh, 401k advice. Hit those and that'll take you to the right place. Tell you more about it. The people that are in this uh, program uh, love it and uh, it's making them thousands of dollars. Going to run a special on this real soon, so stay tuned uh, for a free monthly subscription. Right now, let's get into the RMD requirements and the inherited, uh, inherited IRA uh, potential trust solution workarounds here that were brought about by the SECURE Act. Okay, this is not so much, I mean, we've talked about this previously because the SECURE Act went into place, you know, uh, well over last year. But the, the issue is, is that the new guidance didn't come out until just now, just recently here, the past couple of weeks. So the stretch IRAs are long gone post uh, 2019. So pre 2020, if you had an inherited IRA, you can stretch that out over your beneficiaries, the oldest beneficiaries lifetime. They're coming out with new life expectancy tables that are going to be effective January 1, 2022. Generally, that's going to stretch out longer lifetime. Uh, is, is, uh, so you're going to have lower required minimum distributions on that. Um, and anything that's, that's 2020 inherited in 2020 and beyond are going to be subject to those new life expectancies tables. Um, uh, there's a couple of common sense type of workarounds here. The beneficiaries, if you get an inherited IRA uh, 2020 uh, or thereafter, you could just like say, okay, I'm going to take the RMDs out of that because it has to be exhausted within 10 years. The inherited IRAs now are going to have to be exhausted within 10 years. That means you do your RMDs year one through nine, and then if there's any balance left in year 10, you got to exhaust that no matter what it is. So that could really spike somebody's... Uh, uh, income tax bracket that year. Got to be careful about that. So you got to smooth these out to avoid kicking you up into those brackets. So what I'm saying is take a look at what you got right now. And if you can forego yours because you're not 72, right? You, you don't have to start taking RMDs until you're 72. So you can exhaust your inherited IRAs before then. That allows yours to continue to grow, et cetera. There's some common sense, common sense workarounds here. Other possible solutions, use a Roth conversion. That way you could pay down the estates, reduce the taxes. Remember, charitable IRAs uh, remain, okay? So uh, you, could, you could allow rollovers to qualified charities up to $100,000 once, you know, your required minimum distributions reached. And then whatever's left to charity is a state and, and income tax free. So those donations, you know, that's one way of looking at it. If you have a sizable amount that you're dealing with, 
All right, there's three other uh, solutions that I want to discuss with you briefly now. And if you need to get into this in terms of really tax mitigation planning, et cetera, get into, uh, get, give, a, give us a call and we can go through this. we got a team of experts. I did this for years. I used other uh, lawyers that uh, we were in the same, we were colleagues, still our colleagues. We're in the same mindset in terms of what we uh, do with these things. Uh, and it's dependent upon state law, obviously. Let's look first at GRATS and, and then IDGITS, and then we'll go to SLATS, okay? All right, let's go into uh, GRATS. It's a grantor retained annuity trust, and it's an irrevocable trust. And what we're doing here is we're giving away more than the estate or gift tax exclusion. So you can only, you know, and what you do is if you've got excess, you're going to reduce that. Now, it was pretty hard. I mean, before under the existing law, you know, you could it, basically up to 26 million, something like that, you know, 22, 26 million. It's a tremendous amount of money that uh, was in the uh, estate and gift tax exclusion, but that's going to probably be reduced under the new uh, tax, uh, uh, proposed tax changes here. GRATs are quite effective in low interest rate environments uh, for what should probably become apparent reasons here. Let's talk about some of the mechanics here, and then we, can, we don't have to get down into weeds, but uh, just know that we are in historically in low interest rate environments comparatively, and, and interest rates are starting to go up. This is a great time to start looking at these types of, of plans because of uh, how they interact, how they impact the me uh, mechanics of the plan. So what you do here is that you've got a client, that, that a donor transfers property into a trust in exchange for an annual fixed payment. So what is that? That's an annuity, an annual fixed payment. That's by definition annuity. There's two ways to do this. You can do a charitable lead trust. Okay, in that situation, what you're doing is, uh, and I'm kind of blending over here at Gratz, not necessarily a charitable uh, lead trust or charitable remainder trust. There may you can do these a little bit differently, but I'm just kind of just for uh, convenience sake here, kind of conflating them all. But uh, let's distinguish between the lead trust and the remainder trust. On the lead trust, you're giving the charity annuity payments for a set amount of time, and it's spelled out by law. And then the beneficiary receives the remainder after the charitable portion is exhausted. And it's important that you've got to pick your charity on this because they can't change on the lead trust. Just trying to get you the 30,000 uh, foot level here, uh, get these concepts down, you can drill down into details later on. The remainder trust, the beneficiary receives annuity payments up to a set amount, can't be less than 5% of the corpus or more than 50%, okay? so. You're, you, you're giving the charity annuity payments and simultaneously the beneficiary is getting the use of this too. Now, under some circumstances, the donor could also be receiving benefits of those payments at the same time. And, and, and a big deal on the remainder trust is that you can change charities uh, over time. And in the meantime, if the donor needs to continue funding so that they can continue to get deductions, they can do that but there's a maximum 20 year term on this, then the balance has to be paid to charity. Now, we can move into the IDGIT, the Intentionally Defective Grantor Trust. And although I'm talking about this like it's a specific standalone type, really we use these provisions in a lot of the other trusts in order to make them into grantor trusts. And, the, and what we're doing here is doing that so that we remain taxable so the trust isn't taxable as its own standalone entity it's taxed at the donor's income tax rate which is better typically it's an irrevocable trust it's like the grat the transfer is more than the estate or gift tax exclusion right now it's fifteen thousand per year per grantor per recipient so large families can really benefit off of that and so for married couples that's individual so married couples thirty thousand per year per recipient. Um, now, right now, so like I'm saying, you get 11 and a half, 11.58, I, I think is actually what it uh, is, uh, lifetime exclusion amount. You can do $15,000 per year exclusion up to a lifetime of 11.58 right now. So for a couple, you're doing uh, 23, 23 and change, uh, 23 million and change. That pretty much includes a lot, a, a lot of people. But where we're at right now is 
is that uh, if, if we go back down to the 2009 levels, then what you have is uh, going to be reduced to a million per individual or $2 million per couple. So that's quite a different quite a different rate, quite a reduction. So now these also are quite effective in low interest rate environment situation. Here we have the client transferring property to a trust in exchange for a balloon note. And then the intentionally defective in order to have trust taxed as a transparent entity at individual rates, kind of what I said at the, at the, at the front of this thing, instead of the much higher trust tax rates. Okay, so let's, let's move on then to the uh, SLATs, which is a spousal limited access trust. These also are irre irrevocable. So what you have is one spouse gifting into the trust to benefit uh, the other spouse. And then you have gifting spouse retaining some limited access to the ac uh, assets, but removes them from their combined estates because of the gifting. Now the donor spouse can indirectly benefit so long as the non-donor spouse remains married to the donor. What you usually do is you have, they're not reciprocal, you have them slightly different because if they're reciprocal, it blows it out of the code, of the Internal Revenue Code uh, uh, you know, special treatment. So what you do is usually set up a slat for each spouse so that the trust can uh, the, and, and the spouses can remove the property from their respective estates into the trust. And like I said, the trust have to be a little bit different. And then you got to do this smartly. That's why you really got to use competent counsel in order to do this because limited access to the ac assets that you've gifted disappears once the non-donor spouse dies or if the spouses get divorced. So you got to be really careful there. All right, that's enough for this week. We'll go into a little bit more next week and some of the other areas and specific guidance and, and what the uh, what the comical confusion was. Not so comical if you've got millions of dollars tied into it. But anyway, uh, you guys stay safe, happy, and fully vaccinated out there. If I can give you any help, reach out to me. Give me a call. I'll see you next time.